I'll introduce myself. Uh, hello, everybody. I am a senior in high school, and I'm running this club, this environmental awareness club, as a co-host with Frankie Herrera. Um, I want to thank you all for showing up during the, this event. We will have student speakers, adult speakers, and virtual games just to help bring awareness to climate change, especially because today is Earth Day, and I wanted to have a Zoom um, on Earth Day. Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Usually when people start their clubs in the beginning of the year, they don't really carry it along um, the rest of the year and they disregard it. But um, I definitely did not want to do nothing with this club. So I wanted to stray away from that idea and instead organize a fun game night that sheds light on climate change. So um, first we have our memory game, which the students in the art club at St. Anthony's High School have created this event. Um, and just some information on this game. This is a classic memory game. You flip the cards two at a time until you reveal all the matching pairs. When all of the cards have been matched, um, a button entitled 4C appears in the upper right corner of the game and you press this so it can reveal an alternate set of cards. These depict a future state um, that may become reality if we remain on our current path towards 4C of global warming. Now, Josh Sanchez, the team librarian at the Long Beach Library, will be sharing his screen, showing you all what the game is. And just a quick note that this game is best played in the Chrome browser. Uh, we've heard uh, issues of um, trouble with Safari. All right, I'm gonna do my best, everybody. Please don't judge my um, abilities. <laughs> and by the way, I created this art. Um, I sent like a 12 piece art of all these coral reefs and animals and fishes to Al and then he turned it into a game. So that's what you're looking at right now. And I did this way back in the fall and in around November, I think. So yeah, we've been um, um, in the process to making this event for a while. The, this is the alternate set of cards, by the way. Those were beautiful. This is Kimmy's, if Kimmy wants to say anything about her art. She oh yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, so <laughs> I did these uh, mostly with watercolor. You'll see the birds are in watercolor and I also did the poison dart frog in watercolor. The two monkeys that are matched right there, the Uakari monkey, that was done with colored pencil. And I had a lot of fun doing this because um, it was I was reached out to. And yeah, so I did my art for them. So there's a link in the chat, I think, that Josh posted. You guys can play this game uh, on your own or you can come and watch on the screen that he's playing currently right now. That's the alternate set of cards if you click 4C at the top right, by the way. And this art right here is somebody from the art club at St. Anthony's High School had made this art. I forget who exactly. I think it's Blake. Blake, okay. And that's the alternate set of cards, by the way.
So the high school student who did those artworks is, lives in Abu Dhabi. We challenged Josh to see how many of these he could complete in five minutes. He's actually doing pretty well. Um, it's really interesting to see how all of these students um, from different parts of the world or for these people from different parts of the world and also just from St. Anthony High School to see their artwork and to just be able to see it in this sense it's just really cool so you can see multiple art pieces of art and also have fun while playing the game yeah it's great all right so i think that's i think everyone's got their their fill of watching me struggle so i'll pass it back to maria Okay, so as you saw, there were several templates that you could have had the option to choose from this memory game, um, such as the Amazon rainforest, the rainforest animals, coral reefs, food crops, and the world landmarks. Um, but speaking of the coral reefs, the um, species depicted in this game live in the coral reef ecosystem, and they would have become vulnerable to extinction if coral reefs were to die off due to ocean acidification and global warming. Um, just some background reading on the coral reefs, despite them covering less than 0.1% of all of the ocean floor, coral reefs are estimated to directly support over 500 million people worldwide, and they are among the most threatened ecosystems on the earth. So the alternate cards, these are my deck. Um, they depict an absence of species once the coral reefs disappear. The chalk outline suggests an untimely demise and Rihanna's alternate deck urges us to take action to save our reefs and um, the many species that they support. So now I'm gonna be moving on to the next game theme, which is the Amazon rainforest. So, the species depicted in this game all live in the Amazon and would become vulnerable to extinction if, per, if portions of the Amazon were to become a grassland due to deforestation, fires, droughts, um, which, were to sig which would signify a tipping point if the Amazon were to, were to become a grassland. And this would be believed um, to be irreversible. And now on the alternate card to this, in Kimmy's deck, she had drawn out a wild boar, which is an invasive species that means the boar can survive in a more broader range of habitats than any other rainforest creatures. And in H Hannah's deck, the alternate deck, or the alternate cards depict a species of, um, the species of the rainforest once it disappears. So similarly in Tamara's deck, the animals are replaced by a solitary grass plant. And now I'm gonna be moving on to the next theme, which is the rainforest theme animals. Um, worldwide rainforests and the many species that they support are threatened by deforestation and impacts of climate change. In Blake's deck, um, endangered creatures from these vulnerable ecosystems are um, depicted. And in the, in the alternate set of cards, in Blake's deck, um, they depict a disappearance of these species. And now moving towards the food crops um, theme, the food crops depicted in this game 
there's the food crops. Uh, the food crops depicted in this game will be adversely impacted by climate change. Crop, crop yields will be reduced dramatically in some cases, introducing food security issues and the loss of livelihoods for many communities. So the alternate set of cards on this game is depict, it depicts a potential dire outcome of food crop loss. And now moving on to the next game theme, which is the world landmarks. Um, the iconic world landmarks depicted in this game are vulnerable to destruction by rising sea levels. Scientists warn that many her world heritage sites and iconic monuments would be damaged or destroyed due to extreme storms or flooding. Rising seas and warming um, oceans also pose a great threat to the coastal areas worldwide. And lastly, the alternate cards um, of this deck is in Yuan's deck, the alternate cards depict an iconic landmark submerged by iconic landmarks submerged by rising seas. Um, but now we will be moving on to another student speaker. Who, her name is Isabella Pineda, who is a senior at St. Anthony High School. And she will be talking about the tipping point game. Hello and welcome to the Tipping Point game. Um, this is a puzzle game with a twist. On the welcome screen, select a puzzle image, a slot machine design, and a soundtrack. When the game starts, the pieces of your chosen image are fed into the slot machine. You need to spin and stop the slot machine to get random selections of pieces. Drag and drop the pieces to recreate the image. Repeat as fast as you can to try to complete the puzzle because the tipping points start to show up in your spins as the time passes. If you successfully complete the puzzle, then you win the game. But if any of the tipping points shows up three times, you've run out of time. So now Josh will be sharing his screen about the tipping point game. I think this is the one I struggled with the most because it's the music is really good and I'm very much affected by music so it's got me stressed out you I probably can't hear it through the screen share but if you're playing along you can hear it I believe Josh also put it in the chat so um, you can play along with him or you can just watch him One of the fun things about this game is that uh, students can customize those audio tracks and it's a it's kind of a fun process to come up with a, a series of three different soundtracks that convey uh, an increasing level of uh, intensity <laughs> and panic. Look at that, that's the first time I've ever gotten it. So that's actually my slot machine design. I had some some fun with some actual uh, jack o' lanterns that people had carved and uh, and put it together in a Day of the Dead theme. Do they do they just come from uh, still photos, or how did you uh, digitize that? It's really interesting. <clears throat> Yeah, that's just part of my my process of working with uh, images and and then turning them into more painterly things. Uh, 
Um, by the way, to the participants, uh, our Q&A is open. So if you do have any questions about uh, the game or anything like that, feel free to send in a question. Oh no. Okay, that's that's pretty good. Once you've placed it, you can't change it. That's uh. <laughs> but you can place a spot, a piece over it. Okay, good to know. So you can correct mistakes. And in the first uh, iteration of the game, it wasn't actually a drag and drop. It was a click on it and then click in the second location where you wanted to go. So it was even harder. <laughs> mm -hmm. We had an event uh, last night for Beaverton, Oregon, and uh, one of the students there created uh, one of the puzzle images. And it's by far the hardest one in the in the whole deck. It's uh, it's a forest scene with uh, beautiful trees, but it's really hard to tell the trees apart. Yeah, I, I tried that one and immediately got frustrated. <laughs> Looks like you might have two Arctic tipping points there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so I think I'll go ahead and I will send it back to Maria. Thank you, Josh, for playing that. That was great. Um, okay, so now I'm going to be introducing um, Matt Amos, who he is a creative speaker who developed. Actually, Maria, well, one second. Sorry about that. Uh, Isabella yes. needs to talk about the, the oh, game. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the game. Um, each of the puzzle piece depicts a climate change solution. The slot machine symbolizes the uncertainty associated with climate change and the reality we are gambling with our future by delaying climate action. The game highlights the opportunities we have to address the climate crisis and the risks associated with our failure to do so. If we delay or stumble in our pursuit of solutions, we may reach tipping points that lead to irreversible climate change and runaway warming. The game features seven distinct climate climate tipping points, which are represented by slot machine graphics. You can read identifying information for the tipping point graphics by mousing over the icons on the welcome screen. For now, I will be sharing with you two tipping points that have actually personally stuck with me since learning about them in environmental science class. First, the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon rainforest has been called the lungs of the planet for its important role in removing carbon from the air. It's an important part of our weather system too for its role in holding moisture from rains and preventing it from leaving the broader region too soon, which would cause a drought. The rainforest is home to millions of plant and animal species, countless of which haven't even been identified and hold many important discoveries for science and medicine. Deforestation through agricultural activities not only destroys this essential resource, but endangers the remaining rainforest by weakening the edges to fire and pests and altering the climate to make naturally occurring fire and deforestation more likely. And lastly, the coral reef die off. Corals are an important habitats for all kinds of sea life. As much as 25% of all marine fish are an important element in coastal geography, affecting currents and flooding and directly provide the livelihood for more than 500 million people. Coral reefs bleach and die when the ocean acidifies when it absorbs too much carbon, 
and as the ocean warms. Chemicals from sunscreen, agricultural runoff, and other sources also make corals prone to bleaching. Ocean acidification is happening at a rate only previously seen in greenhouse in a greenhouse event 55 million years ago, when there were massive extin extinctions and huge ecological changes on Earth. When corals can't recover from die-off, the entire ecosystem is destroyed, leaving all its species vulnerable. One type of organism, coccolithophores, may even play a part in ocean cloud cover, so their disappearance would also affect climate change. Thank you. Um, now I will be moving on to the Climate Reality Project, and now I'm going to be introducing Matt Almos. So he is a creative leader who develops and produces experience for live theater and themed entertainment. Matt attended the Climate Reality Leadership um, Training in Atlanta in 2019 and has been giving presentations about the climate crisis since. As a writer and director for, the live, for live theater, his productions have honored by the, um, have been honored by the Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle, Ovation Awards, Stage Raw Los Angeles Theater Awards, and more. He lives in Burbank with his wife, Carolyn, and their two spoiled dogs. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. And give me one second. There's my ECI I did not do very well uh, on, the, uh, on that previous game, but I did my best. I gave it my best shot. Um, so are you, hmm, are people seeing a, a, an image of the earth right now on their yeah. screen? Yes. Yeah. You are, okay. You're not seeing my notes. No. no you're not, okay. I'm, for some reason, I'm not seeing that, that green square that makes me feel like it's working, but okay. All right, I'm diving in. So hopefully what you're seeing on your screen right now is a picture of me and a bunch of other people staying in, staying in front of a castle. Uh, this just gives you a little window into uh, my life. Uh, as um, as uh, our host just mentioned, uh, my background is in live entertainment and theater, and I work for companies like Walt Disney Imagineering. Uh, I spent about seven years of my life leading the live entertainment development for Shanghai Disneyland. So that's actually in Shanghai, China. That's the largest Disney castle on the planet. Uh, but we are not here to talk about Disney. We are here to talk about uh, climate change. I'm here on behalf of this organization, the Climate Reality Project, which is founded by this guy. This is former Vice President Al Gore. Uh, he was Vice President to Bill Clinton uh, in the 90s. And he went on to, uh, to be a great advocate uh, for this issue. He released a movie in 2006 that won the Oscar. Uh, it was called An Inconvenient Truth. And in that movie, he gave this amazing slideshow presentation about climate change that really helped people like me understand that this is a huge problem. And then he founded this organization, Climate Reality Project, to train people like me uh, to give presentations kind of like that. And they do this because of this statistic. Each month, fewer than one in four Americans hears someone they know talk about climate change. And we'll talk later about why that's an issue. But let's go ahead and get into the, let's go and get into talk about uh, the subject we're here to talk about. Uh, the facts of climate change can be crystallized down into just 10 words. It's real, it's us, experts agree, it's bad, there's hope. Um, so we will use those words to kind of guide us through this little short uh, presentation here. And let's start with the first four. It's real and it's us. Uh, climate change is real, it's happening, and we are the ones who are causing it. Uh, it is, uh, the, the story of climate change is really a story about our atmosphere. This is a photo of the planet Earth taken from the International Space Station. And you're seeing that thin blue line, that's the two lowermost layers of our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is this blanket of gases that surrounds our planet. And when that atmosphere is in balance, it helps us enjoy this livable temperature that we enjoy on this, on this planet. Unfortunately, we are knocking it out of balance by sending a whole lot of global warming pollution into it every 24 hours. And we're doing it in a wide variety of ways. 
Uh, you've heard us uh, uh, some mention of uh, deforestation, uh, agriculture, uh, all these different ways that we are sending this pollution into our atmosphere. By far the greatest source of this pollution though is the burning of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas. This chart kind of shows you how that has ramped up since the year 1850 until uh, just a year or two ago. You can see it really accelerated around 1950 there after World War II. Uh, so you may look at this and say, okay, pollution is bad, but what does this have to do with the planet getting hotter? Well, um, it has to do with that blanket. Uh, the, the way the atmosphere works is that we have radiation coming in for the sun, and then some of that radiation bounces off, uh, off the earth and out into space. And then some of it though gets trapped by that blanket. And the thicker that blanket is, the more carbon dioxide, the more methane that is in that blanket, the more radiation gets trapped and the hotter our planet gets. How much hotter? You ask, this much hotter. Uh, this shows you how our temperature has changed since the year 1880. What you see from this is that 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have all occurred since the year 2001. And the hottest five have been the last five years. And actually this slide is a little bit out of date because 2020 last year was actually tied for being uh, the hottest year on record. So that's, it's real and it's us. How about experts agree? How many experts agree about this? Pretty much all of them. 97% uh, or more of actively publishing climate scientists agree that it's real and that it's us. Pretty much every reputable scientific organization on the planet has a statement that agrees uh, to these facts. So the consensus is completely overwhelming. As I've heard one, uh, uh, one scientist say, it's similar to the consensus on whether gravity is real. Okay, so just to give you a sense of that, uh, these are the, the toughest words in here. It's bad. And these wonderful games that you've uh, seen, uh, the St. Anthony High School Environmental, Environmental Awareness Club pull together here, are giving you a window into all the different ways it's bad. It's impossible in a short presentation to touch on all of them, but I will just, I'll just try to touch on a few more things that have been happening really recently, uh, thresholds that we've been crossing on our planet. Well, we just crossed a big one right here in LA. We set a new temperature record for LA County uh, just last September. Temperature records like this are being set all over the world. You see it in the news every day. I'll tell you the one that really caught my attention though was this one. This was last summer in Siberia. This is in the Arctic Circle. This is the hottest temperature that has ever been recorded in the Arctic Circle. And it's not hard to extrapolate why that's a bad thing because there's a lot of ice up there. <laughs> And if that ice, if the more of that ice melts, it was mentioned earlier, yes, it's a threat to, uh, to rising sea levels. It's a problem for rising ocean temperatures, which, uh, uh, which contribute to the, the problems that our coral reefs are facing, as, as has been mentioned before. Uh, all these things are being kind of amplified. The hydrological cycle, that causes evaporation from the ocean that turns into rain. It's all kind of being uh, put on steroids uh, with these rising temperatures. And as a result, you're getting rain events that are very intense and very intense flooding events as well. Uh, the same thing that is ramping up that uh, hydrological cycle that's pulling more water from the ocean is also pulling more water from the land. And this is leading to longer and deeper droughts uh, like Brazil experienced uh, just a few years ago, like California is experiencing uh, right now. And uh, well, if you combine record heat and record drought, uh, record dry conditions, what is that a recipe for? And again, we all know this because we were living it. We lived it last summer. The eyes of the world were on us as we experienced all those wildfires here in Northern California, all the way up the coast, uh, the West Coast of the United States. Now you hear people say, 
well, gosh, you know, we had big fires 30 years ago, or we had floods. This is nothing new. What, what are we worrying about? And the reality is that it is something new. It, it, we count these things. We count the, the, the frequency of these weather events, and you better believe the insurance companies count them as well. So this is definitely something that's continuing to increase. Uh, in the games that, that, uh, that the team here shared, they spoke to the challenges on our food system uh, that are caused by this heat. They've, uh, they've reflected in their games in a much more powerful way than I can. Uh, the risks that climate change poses uh, to the, all the animals that we share our planet with. Um, and again, I'm just saying there's so much more. It touches on so many other aspects of our life that, that we can't really get into. Uh, and all of these things are, are uh, well, they cost money. Uh, they, they damage property, all these things, so that year after year, uh, the World Economic Forum names climate change as the number one threat to the global economy. But for me personally, and for many of the people in the movement uh, who I know, this is not our, the, the biggest concern. The money is not the biggest concern. The biggest concern is this, that the people who are least responsible for climate change, the people who are consuming the least, the countries that are emitting the least greenhouse gases are the ones who are disproportionately suffering the consequences. And this flood in Bangladesh that happened uh, just last summer is a perfect example of this. This is a nation of 165 million people that experienced an historic flood that flooded a quarter of their country uh, and caused millions of their, uh, their citizens to lose everything. Um, they're responsible for the tiniest fraction of emissions that we are uh, in the United States. Uh, it is not fair, it's not just. Um, and there are examples like this, not just in Bangladesh, they're everywhere, including right here in our own country where the people of the lowest income and disproportionately communities of color are disproportionately suffering the worst effects. So this is an issue of justice. That's the biggest reason it's bad, in my opinion. Uh, so listen, in 2015, just a few years ago, the whole world got together and they agreed to work to, to set goals and work together uh, to change, uh, they, to achieve net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century, but to be real, the overwhelming scientific consensus says that in order to achieve the most ambitious of these goals, we have to reduce those emissions very fast. Uh, it is a just a massive and unprecedented reduction of emissions that has to take place. These scientists, uh, uh, the scientists who were commissioned uh, by the United Nations came back with a study that said that we have to cut emissions in half by the year 2030, uh, if we are going to achieve the most ambitious goals of the Paris Agreement. So, uh, you know, is a change like this or even close to this, is this possible? And that will segue me to the final chapter here, which is that there's hope. There's hope in solutions that we have uh, in wind power and in solar power that, that enable us to create energy in a way that's clean and that does not emit. Uh, and the reality is that these approaches are being embraced and they're being embraced more and more year after year. You have countries like Denmark that are now getting almost half of their electricity from wind power and wind has the ability to supply worldwide. Uh, our electricity needs 40 times over if we were to really invest uh, in, that, in that approach. The story with solar is even more dramatic. Uh, even more and more people year after year, more countries embracing this as a source of energy. And part of that is because it's not just that it's cleaner, but that it's, it's cheaper. It is making more and more economic sense to go down this road and that's exciting. And again, there's such potential uh, for this solution to solve a lot of problems around energy. 
Uh, our country has been increasing our investment in solar and wind year after year. Yes, there is still investment in natural gas, but the trend is, is pretty clear where things are heading. You don't see any investment in coal up here anymore. And you know it's an issue when you go to the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum and you go look up on the roof and what do you find? You find solar panels. So if that doesn't indi indicate where things are heading, I don't know what does. Uh, transportation is an issue. There's so many, much emissions from, from vehicles on the road. Electric cars are a big solution and they are. That use is increasing year after year. We are leaders in this uh, in California. By far, we are the largest market for electric vehicles in the United States. And it's worth noting that just, uh, just a few weeks ago, the largest automobile manufacturer, manufacturer in the world said they are going to eliminate the manufacturing of gas and diesel, uh, diesel cars by 2035. Um, Climate Reality Project is a nonpartisan organization. Uh, however, we have to uh, pay attention to the news that happened this morning, which is that uh, the president announced, you remember me mentioning before, to reach the most aggressive goals of the Paris Agreement, we have to cut our emissions in half by 2030. And our president came out this morning and said, that is our goal. That's the first time that's been said. It is a very aggressive goal. It's just words. <laughs> it's not action yet, but it's something. Uh, that, along with the, uh, the other investments that he's talking about making are definitely reason for hope. Uh, the public opinion continues to shift in this direction. And you feel it when you go to events like the People's Climate March. So there is change that's happening. Is it happening this fast though? Absolutely not. The change that is happening has to accelerate a lot. We need more stuff like this where we get together and ask ourselves, everyone ask ourselves, what can we do? Um, and I think we're gonna talk a lot more about this later. So I'll just be super brief and just tell you a couple of things that I really believe. One is I can't stress enough how important it is to join a group. Look at what this group did, the St. Anthony High School Environmental Awareness Club. Uh, and there's so many other groups out there uh, that will give you information about ways that you can lower your carbon footprint and also more importantly, tell you uh, when you can, what are opportunities when you can raise your voice and tell your leaders that this is important to you. And I'll drop some links in the chat in just a little bit uh, to share some uh, links for some of these organizations. Uh, my friend Ava Acevedo is going to come in later and talk about this opportunity uh, to, uh, to participate as well, uh, the Green Schools campaign. And the last thing I will say is it's important to talk about it uh, because of this statistic, fewer than one in four Americans hear someone they know talk about climate change. We need to convince more people to take action on climate change because who has the greatest power to convince people to do that? It's not the scientists, it's not the politicians, it is us. It is, it's us talking with our friends and our families uh, and uh, with, our, with our social circle and just letting them know how we feel about it and that it's important and sharing what we know. I will just quickly wrap up with giving this wonderful writer, Mary Hegler, the last word. This is uh, from an article uh, she wrote for Wired Magazine uh, just a couple months ago. And she says, I've often heard the question, what's the one thing people can do? There's no such thing, I wish there were. The answer emerges as quite simple. Do what you're good at and do your best. Join something bigger than yourself because this is so much bigger than any of us alone. It's about all of us together. The world is not falling apart in front of our eyes so much as it is falling into our hands. What will happen if we're brave enough to catch the falling pieces? And that concludes my little part of the presentation. And I think we're gonna play some more games now, right? So I think I'm handing it off to Kimmy. Thank you.
Yes, thank you. Sorry, it's always those on mute buttons. <laughs> anyway, so basically the next game that we're going to be playing is called Carbon Crush, and it's a matching game inspired by Candy Crush. Instead of candies, this game features greenhouse gases, GHG mo molecules. As in Candy Crush, you can move a molecule one spot vertically or one spot horizontally in order to create one set of mat one what, excuse me, in order to create matching sets of three, four, or five in a row of that same molecule. When matched, the molecules will crush, disappear, shifting the molecules above them into the vacated spots. When matches of four of a kind are achieved, a related special molecule appears. This special molecule can then be matched with the related molecules that spawned it. When you match five of a kind in a row, a color bomb appears. If a molecule is moved onto the color bomb, all molecules of that same type of on that bomb on the board will be crushed. And now I think Josh will share his screen for the game. Yes, um, we also had a question. Um, somebody wanted to know if these are playable on mobile devices. Um, most of these games are not designed for mobile. Um, they're all the efforts of volunteers that, that we at Artworks for Change connected with uh, on volunteer matching sites. Um, so we got them into as good a form as we could on the time timeline that we had. So we hope you enjoy them on uh, on desktop for now. All right, let's give this a go. I believe Josh shared this game in the chat, so you can either play it or you can watch and follow him along. And if you're curious to know which molecules are which, under the achievements boards, they have the regular and the bonus. Um, they have like the points and the times, um, whatever points you get. And if you hover your cursor over them or your, your mouse thing to, in simple terms, see as he's doing, um, it tells you which ones are which. And if you click on them, it will take you to a Wikipedia site where you can learn more about them. Oh, that was a good one. And I will just say, if this becomes your favorite thing to do when you should be in class, uh, I do not accept any responsibility for that. <laughs> At least it's educational, so you're still getting an <laughs> educational aspect. <laughs> you're, you're helping climate change. That's a new one. That's interesting. Okay, so about a little bit about this game um, as he is um, as Josh is playing it. Um, greenhouse gases come from a broad range of sources and can have varying effects on the Earth's warming. Two key ways in which these gases differ from each other are their ability to absorb energy and how long they stay in the atmosphere. The larger the global warming potential of a gas, the more, ga the ga the more that gas warms the earth compared to CO2 over a specified period of time. The scoring in the carbon crush game is based on the warming potential of each molecule with higher points being awarded of the, for the removal of gases that have a higher warming potential. Many players might not notice this, much like most of us don't pay attention to the different types of greenhouse gases being released in the atmosphere. The special molecules in this game represent opportunities to remove GHGs from the atmosphere or from the waste streams in which they are generated. Examples of these special molecules include 
when you match the four CO2 molecules, a bismuth molecule, a bismuth special molecule appears, and researchers are exploring the use of bismuth to convert CO2 into liquid fuel. After matching four methane CH4 molecules, zeolites appear. Zeolites are used in methane capture technology. And the color bomb represents a carbon pricing solution. By putting, a steadily, by putting a steadily rising price on pollution via a carbon tax, for example, we can eliminate emissions on a scale that matches the magnitude of the problem. A carbon tax would reduce emissions throughout the economy by encouraging consumers and producers to shift away from dirty and increasingly more expensive fossil fuel energy sources to clean energy sources. And then in the buy in for buying time for this, um, the primary benefit of matching a special molecule in the game, including the color bomb, is that additional time gets added to the game clock in proportion to the warming potential. This represents the benefit of reducing emissions effectively in the real world. And we buy ourselves more time to adapt to climate change and prevent further de-establization de of our world. And Josh, you can demonstrate that by dragging any of those molecules onto that rainbow thing. Oh, okay. So try that out and you'll see that time gets added. You just got 30 more seconds to, uh, to work away on the atmosphere. That's, that's a lot of pressure for one person. <laughs> um, I did want to share with everyone, there was a question um, and I'm going to kick it up to somebody who has a little bit more scientific knowledge, um, and maybe we can have them rephrase if necessary, but they asked if molecules help us convert into CO2. Um, someone want to take a crack at that? Um, so the, uh, I think this, this question probably refers to the, uh, the bismuth technology. Uh, it's, it's a form of electrolysis where um, CO2 is pulled from, uh, from the atmosphere and then through a chemical reaction, it's turned into uh, a fuel molecule of some sort uh, through, through, again, through an electrolysis process. But one of the challenges with many of these technologies is that uh, when they are competing with, uh, with fossil fuel energy, uh, which is artificially cheap because the polluters aren't paying the cost to society, uh, it takes it takes much longer for them to ramp up and and succeed. And so uh, we'll hear from speakers uh, uh, later in this program about the role of uh, kind of creating a level playing field through getting the price right on fossil fuels relative to clean solutions. Okay, so now we are moving on to the next game. This is going to be the snowman game that I did. Um, so just some introduction on the game. This is a classic game that most people first encounter as hangman. Um, you can just you can start a game by choosing a snowman design and then se selecting a difficulty level level either easy, medium, or hard. So once you are on the game page, you can choose a puzzle category from the drop down menu. If you choose easy, then you are allotted eleven incorrect letter guesses before you lose. Um, for medium, if you choose medium, you are allotted eight incorrect letter guesses. Um, and for difficult, you get five incorrect letter guesses. Your goal is to complete, complete the word puzzle before you run out of letter guesses. So now Josh will be sharing his screen and showing you all the game. He put it in the chat too. So if you wanna play, you can play on your own or you can um, watch his screen and then he'd just be playing. I think for this one, I'll encourage audience participation because I will, I will be playing on easy and needing all the help <laughs> I can get. <laughs> so just a fun fact, I created this on Notability. I created the art part of it. So uh, yeah, I created like 12, um versions of this game and then i split it off into eight and then five 
And that's what you're looking at right now. And some background information on this. I did that art and then this is the victory scene. So if you win, this is what um, it would look like. And then on the defeat scene, Jamie, she's a panelist, but um, she helped me create the defeat scene. So if you lose, um, you can see her art. So maybe we'll encourage Josh to lose this round so we can see Jamie's <laughs> art. I'm actually, I'm trying and... <laughs> Better lose. There we go. <laughs> oh, there it is. This is her art, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, this is what it would look like if uh, we weren't like sustainable and we didn't use like renewable or we didn't use um, that many sustainable resources. So yes, this is what the world will look like. <laughs> Anyone have any guesses about what this might be? Oh, okay. By the way, this will be the, the last puzzle before the next speaker. I think Josh is engrossed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and kick it back over. Okay, so I'll explain this the following gameplay. So in this gameplay, the classic hangman is about saving someone who has been condemned to die. The snowman had the snowman game cons conveys a similar message about climate crisis. With each incorrect guess, the snowman melts away piece by piece but all is not lost if you ultimately solve the puzzle. Um, the idea is that by educating ourselves about climate change and working to solve the climate challenges, we can stabilize um, the climate and control our fate. So in the next panelist, we have Dylan Charnon um, and I will introduce him right now. So he is a member of the Long Beach chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. Citizens Climate Lobby is a nonprofit partisan organization that, focus, that focuses on national policies to address climate change. They aim uh, to get individuals to advocate in their communities and reach their representative, representatives to um, co-sign bills and eventually pass them through Congress. Their climate solution is to put a price on carbon and become net zero by 2020. 50. Um, this would provide affordable, clean energy, especially for more vulnerable communities. We are also joined by the Long Beach CCL chapter leader, Eric Geis, who will be monitoring, monitoring the chat for your questions. And Josh, I believe will post more links about the Citizens Climate Lobby. So the next speaker is, um, Dylan Charnon. Hi everyone. Here, let me um let me share my, my screen real quick. Um, we've got a little presentation today, and let me put it into presentation mode. So yeah, hi, welcome. Uh, first things first, happy Earth Day. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about solving the climate challenge. Um, as Maria said, we're working with the Citizens Climate Lobby. And 
So a little bit about us, a little bit about me. I'm a student at Cal State Long Beach and I'm working as an intern for the Citizens Climate Lobby, the Long Beach South Bay chapter. And one of the reasons um, personally why I'm kind of invested in these climate solutions is because I grew up in a real rural area in Girdwood, Alaska. And um, I saw firsthand, you know, the negative uh, implications or effects that climate change had on our area, whether it was melting glaciers or uh, fish populations not returning to the communities because of rising sea temperatures and sea levels. So it was just, it was, um, it was a very firsthand experience. And so I wanted to, to get involved. Um, and also with me today is Edric Guys, and he's our group leader for the Long Beach and South Bay chapter. And he'll be here to answer any questions you guys have in the chat. Um, he's also putting some CCL youth related links in there as well. So please feel free to click on those, check those out. Um, but yes, he is here to answer any of the questions throughout in the chat. Uh, so what are we up against? We're, we're up against record setting temperatures, extreme weather events, rising sea levels, severe droughts and increasing ocean temperatures. Uh, as Matt was saying in the previous uh, presentation, you know, we've seen this locally uh, throughout Southern California with uh, the record setting temperatures of 121 degrees as recently as last year. Um, the uh, severe droughts in Southern California and even across the nation in Texas, uh, on the Northeast, uh, in Siberia. So it's, a, it's a, not just a local problem, a national problem, but it's a global problem. And so this is, this, these are some of the challenges that we are up against um, in terms of climate change. And so what, what's our solution with CCL? We really focus on the carbon fee and dividend. And the carbon fee and dividend is basically a charge on fossil fuels at the source. So, so this will be placing a, a fee on uh, power plants or big industries that's burning these fossil fuels. And so this money then is actually um, put uh, back into the pockets of the taxpayers and the households, um, specifically uh, those who are most vulnerable, those who are in poverty or low income as a form of, in a form of a dividend. And it's basically, it's, it's free money. So uh, who wouldn't, who wouldn't like that? Uh, and so what we're doing, um, powering America forward towards clean energy. So the shift away from burning fossil fuels into more renewable sources and one way um, to really get this motion going is through the carbon fee by placing a carbon fee and then returning this money to the, to the uh, taxpayers. And so this bill, the Energy Innovation and uh, Climate Act, is, it's, it's co-sponsored by uh, quite a few members. Here we have 36 listed, but I know now it's up to 40. Um, as you can see here, they are all uh, off with the Democratic Party, but with CCL, we hope to reach to, to every party, Republicans, or, and just to get everyone involved, because it's not just a one-sided uh, issue. It is, we need to come together uh, in unison to really tackle this problem rather than going back and forth, because it is something that needs to be addressed now um, through Congress, through action, through these bills, such as the Carbon Fee and Dividend Act. Um, so here, a couple benefits. We'll focus on four today. Um, the first one being net zero by 2050. The second being affordable, clean energy. Third being saving lives. And fourth, putting money back into your pocket. Um, so first, net zero by net zero by 2050. Whoops, let me go back. Um, this policy will reduce Americans' carbon pollution by 30% in the first five years and is the single most powerful tool we have to get us to net zero by 2050. Um, we realize there's other actions being taken, but um, one of the, we really do believe that this, this act is our most powerful tool to get us to this net zero by 2050 goal. Um, the affordable, affordable clean energy. With this policy, the government sets the direction and businesses respond in order to provide abundant, affordable, and reliable clean energy. This clean energy innovation will drive us faster towards net zero pollution. So again, moving away from fossil fuels with the big corporations and shifting towards renewable clean energy. Uh, saving lives. 
This policy will improve health and save 4.5 million American lives over the next 50 years by reducing pollution Americans breathe, poor air quality, uh, Americans breathe. Poor air quality is responsible for as many as one in 10 American deaths today and sickens thousands more, um, especially those with asthma or lung conditions that you might know of. So this is, it, it really is saving. Um, we are trying to save lives, the planet and all of us together. Uh, and fourth, finally, putting money back into your pocket. I think this is my favorite one. Um, this policy is affordable for any ordinary Americans because it puts money in your pocket. The money collected from the fee is given as a monthly dividend or carbon cash back payment to every American to spend with no restrictions. No restrictions meaning um, if you need a new laptop for school, if you need um, or money for lunch or snacks, you know, it's there's no restrictions. So I, I it's, a, it's as good as it gets. Uh, most low and middle income Americans will come out financially ahead or break even. So this is dividends help poor and minority families. So with this graph, you can really see that with this dividend, it is benefiting over ni nearly 90% of poverty and low income families. Um, it's, it's reaching out, it's helping minorities and families of four, single parents, even older adults. So there are lots of benefits here. So yeah, as, as um, the slide shows, a majority of people in groups um, flagged as most vulnerable have a net gain. And so low income and poverty uh, families benefit most, uh, which, is, which is what CCL is about. We really, wanna, we really wanna help benefit those who are most vulnerable. Um, Cause this is, it's really, it's not just an economic uh, justice uh, issue, but it's also an environmental just, justice problem. So. The more, if we can uh, get two birds with one stone, this is this is the way to go. And so here with this, uh, with the Energy Innovation Act emissions reductions, this is where we currently sit. So business as usual, we're we're at we're we're gonna keep going, and by 2050, be at negative one percent away from our goal of 100 um, percent. But as you can see with the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, we're we're pushing towards 90 percent percent by 2050 and although that's not the full 100 percent as you can see as the ipcc um the guidelines show it does fall it does it is it, it does fall very close so there is still work to be done but with this act we get we get 90 percent of the way by 2050 which is great it's still in the range between 1.5 degrees celsius and 2 degrees celsius um, and how do we do this? We do this, we, we build political will to act on climate. Uh, that's reaching out to our representatives, whether it's uh, emails, phone calls, social media, a lot of them are very active online. Um, and it's just, it's you making a difference, no matter how, how little, how big, it just any, any little thing helps because we can't let this um, problem slip through the cracks anymore. As, as I'm sure all of you guys are aware. Um, and so as a, as a, as a group CCL volunteers, we held over a thousand meetings last, um, last year in 2020 with members of Congress. And what's really impressive to me is that this was over, this was during the pandemic. So this just shows how active, um, how passionate, how driven, uh, the CCL volunteers really are to really get the word out, um, and work together with Congress. Um, which is something which is multiple, uh, multiple steps ahead of um, uh, any other groups out there, really, which is, which is great. You know, these guys are reaching, um, re really putting the effort in. Um, and so, yeah, one of the last things um, we're encouraging or really hoping you guys uh, could attend is our online June conference, which is June 12th to the 13th. And yeah. Um, I, the last thing I'd say is TCL is, is really unique because it's spread all the way across uh, the U.S. It's it's nationwide. It's not just local, um, and we focus on the U.S. Congress, which is where the decisions ultimately are made. Um, we all have to make our difference uh, or make a difference, but um, in order to really really make change, it is really important to reach Congress, and so that's why I got involved and. Um, and especially really hope you guys um, 
uh, to take a moment to appreciate what we have today on Earth Day, and we, if we can all come together to work on these solutions, that's that is the ultimate goal. So with that, uh, thank you. And here's Edric, uh, Edric Guys's contact info. He is our group leader for the local, um, for our local chapter, and he's been monitoring the chat. So with, um, with that. Uh, if there's any questions, I will be free to take them. Thank you, Dylan, for that. Now I'll stop we'll... sharing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we'll be moving on to um, the snake game. We have um, one last game. Um, and Al, apart with Artworks for Change, will be explaining this game. And I believe Josh will be sending links if you guys want to play this game or you can just watch along on the screen. Thank you, Maria. Um, and thank you, Dylan, for that really great presentation on Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, as Maria mentioned, I'm with Artworks for Change and uh, I connected with Maria over a volunteer match and she wanted to, uh, to do some uh, uh, designs and I talked her into uh, doing a whole event and becoming uh, a youth leader. And as you can see today, uh, that wasn't hard to do because she was already a youth leader coming in. So um, this is very exciting to be part of this uh, event. Uh, the, I will warn you that the game that's being posted to the chat, it can be somewhat addictive. Uh, it is a classic uh, video game called Snake, um, but we've, uh, we've put a twist on it. Uh, as we have with most of these games. Uh, the gameplay is very simple. You move the snake around uh, the game grid using the arrow keys on your keyboard. Uh, if your snake runs into the walls or the floor or the ceiling or its own body, then, uh, then uh, you have to restart the game and, and start all over again. Um, we are, this is game is still in development. So we, we need to have a start game button so it's not so abrupt but you just have to reset your browser and then kind of uh, jump on the keys to get, get going with the snake as, as you see Josh has, has done there. So sometimes it's hard to get a, a handle on uh, controlling the snake. And what you'll notice is that as you <laughs> <laughs> Remind me not to go driving with uh, with Josh. <laughs> I'm gonna blame the keyboard on this one. Yeah, I think I, it's, I think it's the keyboard. I don't usually use this keyboard, but you know. <laughs> so you can see as he as Josh is eating the apples, the snake is getting longer. So hopefully you guys are getting a chance to get a feel for the game. And then I will start uh, telling you a little bit about what this game means. Uh, and it will tie together a bunch of the things that you've heard from our wonderful speakers to this point. Uh, so basically the snake uh, is uh, a metaphor for our relationship with fossil fuels. Uh, and Josh is gonna do a screen share of some screenshots, uh, but everyone should feel free to continue playing the game on your, on your machine. One of the nice things about this game is you can kind of play it and listen at the same time. Um, so how is this snake a metaphor for our relationship with fossil fuels? Well, basically the, the red apples uh, represent fossil fuels, and it's, it's kind of a biblical reference. It's a reference to the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the world economy started developing very rapidly through the use of fossil fuel energy. Uh, and so you can think about this choice as humanity's original sin, because it, and it, it set in motion the rampant release of greenhouse gases that unfortunately has led to where we are today. Um, so in this game, as in life, we, we operate with, within the limits of a constrained system. Uh, the walls, the floor, the ceiling, we can't move through them. And as the snake gets longer and longer, it, it becomes more difficult to navigate uh, the game environment. <coughs> um, and as a society, 
as we consume more and more fossil fuels, we can see in, in the information that Matt shared that we are testing the limits of our biosphere and it's becoming more and more difficult to achieve sustainable growth and, and stable, uh, 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 the ability to thrive in a stable environment. Um, the other thing you'll notice in the, in the game is that uh, it really is measuring two things. You have a score and then you have this thing called concentration. Uh, well, the concentration is parts per million, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's reflecting the level of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. And the starting level is actually uh, the amount of parts per million that were in the atmosphere at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But as the snake consumes red apples, you'll notice the concentration starts to increase. And at higher levels of concentration, you start to see hazards such as drought, fire and floods that appear on the, on the game grid. And, and those just pose additional threats to the snake's survival. Um, so Josh, if you scroll down, the you'll, people will be able to see um, <coughs> a screen with some of those hazards. You can see the, the little fire graphic, um, a flood graphic, and that little crack in the game board. Those are, are drought, signs of drought. Um, the other thing that shows up after you consume five red apples in this game are green apples. Uh, and they begin to appear on the game grid and they represent renewable energy. Uh, and unlike red apples, the green apples actually don't increase the length of the snake. Uh, and they reduce the concentration uh, of parts per million in the atmosphere by a small amount. Uh, and this aspect of the game just represents the sustainability of renewable energy sources and hints at the hope that Matt was referring to that we have these technologies we just need to scale them up and accelerate the shift to these solutions. Um, and just for reference, you can see that in the game I was playing when I did that screen capture, <coughs> I, I got to a level of, of uh, 486 uh, uh, parts per million. Um, Josh shared uh, a link in the chat uh, of, of a carbon clock and that carbon clock uh, traces where we are today in terms of parts per million. And so you can go back to that clock and check it out over time to see how, uh, how you know, the world is doing towards uh, reducing uh, the amount of greenhouse gases in, in the atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's going on uh, as you start consuming these fossil fuels is you'll see apple pies that start to show up uh, on the gra game grid as well. Um, and the apple pies represent goods and services that are produced and transported using energy. Uh, and this is a reality for everything we consume. Uh, red apple pies in this game are produced and transported with fossil fuel energy, while green apple pies are, are produced and transported with renewable energy. So when you uh, eat the red apple pies in this game, um, the length of the snake uh, uh, gets larger by an amount more so than apples while when you consume green apple pies, it, it doesn't. Uh, but one of the tricks in the game is even once you realize that, that you should maybe stay away from the red apples and red apple pies because they're gonna make the, the game harder to survive, it's actually very difficult to avoid them. Um, and that reflects the reality in our current economy that consuming goods and services produced and transported with fossil fuels is, is pretty much inevitable. Uh, and in order to change this fact, we need to adopt policies that promote a shift away from fossil fuels throughout the entire economy. And I think that's why, um, as Dylan was noting, uh, something like a carbon fee, which will introduce price signals into every, uh, every area of the economy, is really going to be the most cost-effective, most efficient way of driving that, those fossil fuels out of uh, out of the economy. And that brings us to these carbon, these climate policies. So we introduce those into the game and you'll see that there's a, a, a tax graphic and that represents the carbon fee that, that Dylan described. Uh, and, and basically when you place a steadily rising tax on fossil fuels, it makes them more expensive and consumers and producers will, will stop using them and shift to renewables. And as we've seen with, with wind and solar, it doesn't take very long for renewables to, to actually become a cheaper energy source. So in the game, when you consume that carbon tax, the board becomes greener, um, literally. And then all of the red apples and red apple 
pies begin to disappear. Uh, and so you get to cruise around for a little bit consuming only the green stuff. Um, the dividends, which, which Dylan also described, that's uh, depicted as a coin with a parachute. Um, and when you consume that, uh, then all of a sudden you can go through the walls and through the ceiling and through the floor. And that represents the ability of households, especially lower and middle income households with the power of this dividend to, to navigate the clean energy transition. Can you imagine as we're increasing the energy costs, we're also distributing cash to households that actually leaves them with more cash in their pocket than if we hadn't imposed a tax. Uh, that's a pretty great tax. And so you can see why people are pretty excited about it because it will deliver both economic justice in terms of not putting the burden on lower income households, but also environmental justice. As we drive all of those uh, red apples off the board and red apple pies, we're driving out the fossil fuel industries that are polluting in, in lower income communities. And so it makes a clean energy transition much easier on lower and middle income households. And it accomplishes that in, in a very just way. Um, the final icon you'll see on the board uh, from time to time is a subsidy graphic uh, in the form of a dollar bill. Uh, and that represents government subsidies in, and investment in clean energy innovation and carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration is when you pull gases out of the atmosphere and you store them in some capacity that keeps them out of the atmosphere. So these activities provide what are called spillover benefits in the sense that the people who are uh, investing in these technologies will be benefiting more than just the uh, end user of them. They'll be benefiting society at large. Every time, similar to the way that every time we dump pollution in the atmosphere, we're harming people far in excess of what we paid to consume those fuels, so spillover benefits are benefits that accrue to the public at large. So a great example of this would be uh, farmers who use farming techniques like organic farming and permaculture that actually store more carbon in the soil. We want to reward farmers for doing that, and, and this subsidy is, is a way of doing so. Similarly, if you ask someone like Bill Gates what the key is to navigating this, uh, this uh, system-wide transition that needs to happen, he's going to say we need innovation and we need uh, government funding of, of large-scale high-risk projects so that we can have some game changers. Uh, the internet is an example of a government-funded project that became a game changer for everyone. So this game has a lot of stuff built into it, but it's also really fun and addictive, and, uh, and I hope you enjoy playing it. Now we will be going on to the Trello board. So just in the last part of this event, we wanted to mention the Trello board because yes, we can inform everybody about climate change, but now we wanna turn all of that inspiration into action and encourage others um, not only to listen, but to take action too. So I'm gonna introduce our next speaker who is Ava and she is a young environmental activist environmental activist who is currently a high school junior in Lodi, California. Um, since training um, as a climate reality leader this past summer, she has become heavily involved in the Green Schools campaign to inspire students to their transitions to their school's 100% clean renewable energy and has taken the initiative for renewable energy in her own school district. She hopes to help the, um, the environment through law and policy in her future career. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you, Maria. Um, my name is Ava, and um, today I'm going to share with you about this initiative called the Green Schools Campaign. So uh, the Green Schools Campaign is actually a youth-led international initiative that actually just started in August 2020. And its mission is um, we work to help students, parents, and faculty in transitioning their schools or school districts to 100% clean renewable energy. And it actually was inspired by um, a successful movement in 
uh, Los Angeles Unified School District um, at the very end of 2019, and also in Los Angeles Community College Districts, both of which are two of like the biggest school districts in the nation. And from there, we've um, had we've just been working to get other schools from across the country to work hard to make this transition, and it's most definitely possible. Um, Currently, I am trying to take it up with my hometown of Lodi, and it's it's going very well. And I just really, we really, really want as many um, people as possible to try and take this up. Even if you're, um, it could be students, teachers, parents, um, anybody, even in the community that's just very interested in taking this up can definitely do it. It's completely tangible and we're here to help you. We have um, mentors that have done it before and um, students supporting you and just all the resources that you would need for something like this, all of the um, tips and instructions that you would need. And just overall, uh, we really, really hope that you could join in on something like this because it's really surprising um, to think about how, how much that schools contribute to global warming and all the carbon emissions that we see. They're actually, usually the number one emitters of greenhouse gas emissions in a community. And it's pretty ironic because when you think about schools, that's where all the students are. And as young people, a lot of times we're the ones that are most affected by climate change. And so that's why something like this is so important for us to take up because it can, um, it's going to create a lasting effect um, if we take this step to transition our own schools. And yeah, thank you. And if you're interested, um, you can sign up at greenschoolsnow.org slash first step. And um, yeah, from there, we'll definitely contact you and get you set up with somebody locally to help you out. And yeah, that's where your journey begins. So thank you. So now um, I believe Al will provide a summary of her overview of the playlist. Thank you, Maria, and uh, thank you, Ava. That's very inspirational to hear about your work with the Green Schools Campaign and your journey as a, a climate activist as well. So I think Josh is gonna screen share the playlist so that we can walk through uh, a general overview, but I will get started just uh, giving you an idea of what's, what's in here and the general idea. So I think uh, um, it was well stated earlier by Matt, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a climate crisis, uh, it's really about finding ways to contribute and finding your own place in the climate movement by figuring out what you do well and what you can bring to that process. Uh, and so these playlists are about helping you find your lane. Um, the first uh, uh, column of items, uh, getting smart on climate change, these are, are really about uh, educating yourself. And so there are some really inspirational videos in the first card. Uh, in the second card, there's some, some really useful uh, um, videos that get into the science and learning about solution and impacts uh, and, and so that you can become more literate and, and communicate more effectively on climate change to people in your, your family and, and your friend circles. Uh, and then finally, in the last card, you'll see game changers where, where you can really dive in and make a commitment to uh, uh, learning enough about climate change to become uh, a youth activist. Uh, there's a great uh, book list from the library. Uh, there's a, a Citizens Climate Lobby summer program. Um, that's a real intensive uh, climate policy uh, 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 item. There's a, a youth summit coming up with this Spaceship Earth. And there's always uh, the, the opportunity to get leadership training from Climate Reality Project. Um, in the second column, these are ways that you can take action at home. Uh, so again, there's inspirational videos in the first card, including some funny ones. Uh, there are some, some no-brainer actions in the second card, including uh, renewable uh, energy at home. Um, and then finally, there are uh, opportunities to do things that are more programmatic, where you can join uh, a, a local challenge. Uh, you and other families can compete to see who can cut their carbon footprint the most. Um, then the, the third list in your community, Ava gave a great example of uh, change makers in, in, in your community. 
uh, through the Green Schools campaign. So we encourage you to dive into those lists and see if there's something in there and, and just try it on. Uh, sign up for a newsletter, sign up for uh, an organization, attend a meeting. That's how you get started. And finally, going national, uh, get involved with an organization like Citizens Climate Lobby so that ultimately you can make your voice heard at the highest level. You can lobby uh, our Congress people directly and say, look, we need a policy that's going to get us there on the time frame, frame that we have. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Maria um, to uh, give you a tour of what in this playlist appeals most to her. Yes, so Josh, if you click the brain running on the ha hamster wheel on the right, <laughs> that one, that's the one that I found interesting um, the most. It's called Get Involved in the Advocacy for the National Solutions with these easy actions. Um, if you click click the second link under the Jiffy, that one, yeah. I think you have to click the link. It says, okay. Um, I like how simple um, this website was to just to get in touch and start showing your interest in helping out the environment. So I wanted to bring this upon any of the students or anyone who is um, who wants to volunteer for the environment. Um, they will connect you to your local group and provide you with information about the training and resources that you need. You just sign up on here and I believe um, Edric had posted a link in the chat for students to get active um, through this website. But yeah, for the sake of time, I'll move this on to Kimmy, who will be speaking about the basics you need to know. Well, I don't really have too much to say about it, but um, I that was one that I that caught my eye because the best way about understanding a complete concept is educating yourself. And I found that um all of this all of this stuff was very helpful so if you have still more questions or just really are interested in it, and even if you're not i'd still recommend checking it out because you never know you might find something that does interest you and as um josh is about to click on climate change with bill nye that really caught my eye because bill nye is very nostalgic for me because we would watch it all the time uh, like it would play on tv and then it would also play um my science teachers would play it, and um, he his is very captivating. It's a video, and and it's only four minutes. And who doesn't love Bill Nye? Some people might not, but I love Bill Nye, so I'm a little bit biased. But so that's um, so that's what I had to say. So go ahead and check that out. Um, completely recommend it. And thank you. And I think we have Isabella who will be speaking next quickly about the Trello board something that interests her, so. Yeah, so there is one, uh, there are easy actions that you can do at home, um, but more specifically, another easy action that you can do is make your voice heard, which is in the third, or in the last section of it. Um, you can make your voice heard through policy, which is really cool. I really like, and I'm very interested in policy and all of that stuff. So there is actually a link that you can click on that will take you to a page and you can contact your senator, your California senators, and you can contact your local representative as well. Um, it'll just have you fill out your street address and your zip code, and it'll take you to your, um, contact or it will take you to the contact information of your senators and your uh, representatives. Everyone's representative is gonna be different depending on what congressional district you live in. So um, I think for Long Beach, your representative is going to be Alan Lowenthal, but it basically just gives you a quick little script on what to send them. And um, basically just asking that they reintroduce the Energy Innovation and Carbon, Carbon Dividend Act, which was talked about earlier today. So if you found interest in that act, this is a really cool thing to get involved with um, your local government. Thank you for that, Isabella. And now I will make my closing remarks because we're like going two minutes over 6.30. So I just want to thank everybody for 
um, joining and who participated in this Zoom event. Um, there was no better day to plan this event than on Earth Day, and I'm glad we were able to get this done, have a successful event. Um, I hope you all took a mental note on what we went over today and decided, or and I hope you decide to make a change in the future. But I know it's a little late, but you can um, uh, ride a bike, eat less meat, use renewable energy and grow your own produce. And um, of course you can recycle and reuse. And again, I wanna say thank you to everybody who helped me make this event and have a good night. Thank you.